Hello and welcome to another episode of Asperger's Answers. With me is the tribe, and we have <laughs> yes, Miss Heather over here, and Frank, and then obviously I am Danny Rady and our wonderful coach Lauren. Um, so, like always, every Thursday we take questions from our AE Plus support group and answer them more in depth because the support group is an amazing, amazing supportive place. Yes, but. Sometimes the questions that they're asking deserve more than just a one-sentence answer. They deserve us talking about it for 5, 10, 15 minutes. So that's what we do every Thursday, and since it is Thursday, that is what we are going to do now. If you would like to join our AE Plus support group, ask questions to get answered on the show, and really get support from all the other parents, uh, get a uh, Minecraft server that Frank helps run, um, Q&A calls that Lauren helps run, as well as monthly master classes with myself and well the the support group is is the main thing um if you want all of that go to aspergerexperts.com slash support and you can join our support group there so um with that being said let's jump right <laughs> in to the first question here judy is asking how do you handle family who doesn't get it they think your kid is milking it and manipulating us slash others to get her own way. It's like they either don't believe she is Asperger's or her behavior is not indicative of it. The burden I feel to defend my kid is exhausting. We've had to stay with family last month because of the sale of the house we've been renting. We're finally moving into our own place Saturday. Any books or other resources you'd recommend we might suggest to them? I would ignore books and other resources. The problem is not that they have a lack of understanding. It's a lack of willingness. Um, what I would say is that you said it's either that they don't believe she has Asperger's or that her behavior isn't indicative of it. They honestly are probably doing a little bit of both. For me, the answer is simple. Don't feed the trolls. Just just smile and wave. You know, like, just, just <laughs> smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. And, and then... You don't, need, you don't need to accept their advice. It's like, ah, I think you should do that. That's great. I'm going to promptly ignore you now. Like, th that, that's how I do it. Is if people want to give me advice, that's great. I'm not going to listen to you. I don't, uh, you have the right to give me the advice. I have the right to completely ignore you. And I have the right to blatantly say, look, I appreciate you wanting to give me advice. I don't want to give you, I don't want advice. So if you continue to give me advice, I'm just not going to listen to you. No, <laughs> flat out simple. And if you continue need like, <laughs> there have been times where I have told people that and they continue to give me advice and they're on the phone So I just put the phone down and then like pick I've it up every 30 it. seconds and be like Yeah, uh-huh and then put the phone down again and then be like are we done yet? And it's like like okay great talking to you. Bye. And just like I don't, I don't want to hear it I like you as a free willed and free agency human being have the ability to give anybody advice they as somebody with also free will and free agency, have the ability to promptly and completely ignore you. <laughs> we're, ready for we're ready. We're ready. You want to yeah. go ahead? Uh, just, just real quickly, um, yeah. I handle it very differently. Um, for me, it's more about questions. So, if the family is just accusing and not wanting to talk about it, I'm kind of with Danny's approach. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, in my personal life, my personal experience as a coach, it's more about asking questions such as, what area do you feel we're milking it in? Can you explain that to me? And then give me the opportunity to explain to you why we're doing what we're doing. And if it's family, a lot of times they, they're not educated, so educating them. And our site and our resources are a great place to start. I mean, yes, yeah, send them to our website and say, here, watch the sensory funnel video. Here, go and, and learn about defense mode. Mm -hmm. And that, and you're going to be able to feel out who really actually cares about your child and who doesn't. <laughs> and if they don't care, why would you spend any time, energy, okay. or resources at all? I want to. I want this yeah. is this is where I come in because the thing that I see in this question is not how do you handle family who doesn't get it. It is how do you handle family who won't get it. Right. There is a determining factor. And yeah. and yeah. really, what that comes down to is respect that they're asking you for respect that they don't want to show you. And, and respect is a two-way street. So what you're finding here is that you have a boundary of this is appropriate for me and my family. And they're saying, no, we don't respect that. You have to play according to our rules. And that's when you take your toys and go home. 
And <laughs> luckily, that's going to be on Saturday. Yeah. People don't always have that luxury of getting out of the physical space. Unfortunately, confrontation is a necessary part of life. I personally really appreciate confrontation because it leads to resolution. And I love resolution of, of problems, issues, concerns. I do. I love resolution. So I find that this is a place to go. Where is the respect pattern breaking down here? Because it seems like I'm putting a lot of effort into education and explaining to you why I'm doing what I'm doing. And you're not stepping up and trying to work with me. You're showing me just a little less respect because you don't appear to believe me. And that is where I would go to, to a root cause of the problem is, is why is the respect does not seem to be a two way street here? Because yeah. my kid is who they are and I am who I am. And I'm really sorry that we're intruding on your space and you're being very generous but please don't ask me to compromise defense of my child for any other reason ever yeah yes I, I, I'm familiar um, and I, I have a little different thing is is maybe the conversation is so what if they're milking it and and doing whatever like why would you want to break your child's free will Oh, because that's the system that we live in. And but, but you want me to actually answer that question? It's like I since mean, the Industrial yeah, Revolution, that's a it's question like question for the purposes you know, of this show now. Um, <laughs> that's the society but, we live in. I mean, but of course, that's why I do think it. a lot of the defense. I mean, my own personal defensiveness has yeah. come in when people have gotten, you know, in the way of you know, of of me and or or the situation, and maybe not being supportive of not liking how I parent my yeah. kids or or this, and it's like. You know, my job as a parent is to be a guide for my kid. That's how I see it. I'm a facilitator of their experience and their journey and uh, allowing them to have the space to be able to understand who they are. Yeah. And that takes time and it, and it takes allowing them um, to be themselves. And so, you know, the question here is, is, you know, what are they looking for? And yeah. You know, this is them. This is not you. You know, it sounds like you're doing the right things, and if they can't ex be accepting of that, it comes back to this mutual respect thing that that yeah. Heather was talking about. I, I want to address the second part of the statement here. The burden I feel to defend my kids is exhausting. Um, and yeah, Lauren was, was <laughs> I knew like, stop. Gonna, and then I knew what you were going to say, but no, it's true. No, what what I'm saying is is that. Um, while you may feel that burden, it's a two-way street. Like, uh, people can apply social pressure to you, but you need to also accept that social pressure. You can just say, that's great that you want me to change. Continue to want me to change. I'm just going to completely not give you any emotional energy at all. So you can want me to change all day long and give me long lectures on, on why you want me to change. But what I'm going to do is after a while, after you, when you go, I want you to change, like, uh-huh, yeah, that, that's great. And just, like, completely he does do that too, I've ignore seen. you. Like, <laughs> like, you do not need to actually be the nice person and give the respect to them if they are refusing to play and say and, and refusing to do it. It's, it's, it's a question of do you want to salvage the relationship? Is the relationship we're salvaging or is it one of those you see them during Thanksgiving things and that's enough so there's another piece of this that I really wanted to speak yeah. to and you're right you're absolutely right um, the thing that I see also I'm not sure how old the child is in this yeah it doesn't say. in this example but the other thing that I see is that a lot of people accuse children of being manipulative and I think that that's really assuming bad faith on the part of the child. Of and assuming children, that the kid knows how to manipulate. Right. Of course children are manipulative. They have absolutely no control over their lives and they're going to try and get what they want. I mean, that's their job and it's our job to provide the boundaries so they can learn how to work within those. Like you say, you're a guide. But assuming the bad faith, your child is manipulative, they're trying to get what they... Does it look like my child's having a good time? Because I gotta tell you, if my child is melting down, I can assure you that that's far harder than taking out the garbage. You know, to to assume the bad faith on the part of the child is really unhelpful. And, and so I think that that is another place that I would start is, you know, are you gonna respect the space and assume good faith? Because when you assume bad faith, it really can make you a better person because I, you're just assuming that everybody has bad intentions. I, I would also say that assuming bad faith damages the kid's future. I mean, like- And the relationship. And, yeah, and the yeah. relationship, like assuming bad faith over time inevitably leads to trauma and all the science is showing that if you have childhood trauma, you basically, it screws you up for life for the you most the part and you spend the rest of your life recovering and you have massive health issues and you die sooner. So 
you know? And it also becomes, you know, if you tell a child often enough that they're manipulative, somebody that I really respect has introduced me to the concept of a personal narrative. It's the story about yourself that you tell yourself. And if people are assuming good faith and saying, well, I understand why you're working this way, they say, okay, I'm a genuine person and I can work from that. But when you accuse somebody of being manipulative over and over, they start to interpret that for themselves. And they, well, that's part of who I am. I guess I'm manipulative. And people really do internalize these messages. And so it's really important to ask your family to be more positive in their messages. And if they can't be, they need to shut their mouths. Yeah, and I'm looking <laughs> at the word exhausting in here. And yeah. the reason you're exhausted is because you're not honoring your own boundaries. Yeah. Um, you're stepping over what's right for you to try to please other people. And, and they're on a lot of levels, you and, know. Yeah, and, lot, and it never works. Emotionally, mentally, yeah. physically. And so yeah. I look at, when I'm coaching, I look at and that as a, like a, a boundary. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's the moving home. Moment. Top five stressor. Yeah. Just moved. Mm -hmm. No, that's stress. Yeah. Um, but if you're that exhausted, then you got to look at what am I not doing to take care of myself in the situation mm -hmm. and my child. And yeah. usually it's, it's either standing up for yourself or just backing off and just, like Danny said, nope. <laughs> Some people are afraid to risk standing up for themselves. They don't want to come, come across as bullying. They don't want to come across as too forward. I really see that if this is a malleable relationship in which you're invested, it's okay to stand up for yourself and make a mistake about it and be able to process it afterwards. If people are going to judge you on one instance of standing up for yourself, then those people really aren't looking at the world in a dynamic and linear point of view. It's very static and every moment is its own. And that's not your dysfunction and it's not your problem. No, and yeah. just the way you choose to handle it, whatever way that is for yourself, is yeah. really what you have to yeah. honor. Yeah, and and I could definitely see being in this situation. You do have a lot of gratitude because these people have stepped up and helped you. And mm -hmm. but there is this boundary violation, and sometimes when people are doing things for us, we set aside our own boundaries because of well, how grateful we are. But it's well, also it's more vulnerable. And it's more vulnerable. Yeah. And so you know, realize that that might be the situation and. It's complicated. And it's complicated, just, and you're, and you're, you're doing, doing your best. Yeah. yeah. And just don't do it in front of the child if you can remember to do that. Right. Um, uh, have a unless conversation. Unless it's positive. Yeah. If it's well, a positive conversation, definitely involve yeah. your child. But what I would say, though, is, is by doing it, I would say show your humanity in front of your child, but you don't need to have that conversation right. in front I of your agree. child. But mm -hmm. you can be human, and you don't need to, like, hold it all in and, 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 and suppress it all. Right. Because... That demonstrates to a kid whenever they feel anything wrong, they don't see anybody else doing that because everyone else is hiding it, and then they feel like they're the only one. They're the only one, and something is wrong with them because nobody else ever gets depressed because everybody in the family is actually really depressed. They just all hide it. Well, and guess what? That leads to defense mode because mm -hmm. yeah. they suppress, suppress, suppress. That's push kind it down. of a direct path to defense mode. That is the direct, direct path. Yeah, it, it is absolutely yeah. the yeah. 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 Shut yeah. it down. Nope. So, <laughs> all right. so, no, we just, didn't just have any thoughts down. about that whatsoever. Yeah, no, no thoughts. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, we're going to take a quick break here, and then we will be back completely changing subjects. Uh, what do you do when therapists say your son will never be able to live independently? So, we'll be talking about that when we get back. See you in a sec. For a long time now, I've been sitting on the sidelines just trying to stay out of it and um, just watch with thorough enjoyment at Danny's responses and the window into his life and all of your questions and your incredible answers. And lately I've been, been uh, chiming in and it's really fun to be able to help parents who ask a question about uh, experience with IEPs or experience with homework it's extremely rewarding to be able to give back and to help the community. And you know what, I'm, I'm still learning to this day from all the other parents who share experiences. And it's actually pretty cool to realize that I'm to this day not alone in this world and how um, common many of the Asperger characteristics are from uh, individual to individual. I didn't know how difficult it was for those with Asperger's to try different foods. I didn't know that there was sensory overload. I didn't know how common it was for d people like Danny to walk into a store like Kmart with fluorescent lights and how common it was to have a meltdown because of the overwhelm of the lighting. It was a very, very lonely experience raising a kid with Asperger's. 
And fortunately, today there are many, many more resources available. And that certainly would have helped us raising our son, Danny. You are not alone in raising your child with Asperger's. There are many resources available in this world. And many parents have been through very similar situations. There's no reason you need to be alone in this world when you raise your child with Asperger's. And we're back with me, as usual, still. What are you laughing at? <laughs> um, because I'm Beethoven. Yeah. Never gets old. <laughs> yeah, she always goes, You're welcome, I'll be Travis. back, and then I'll be Beethoven. It's like... Uh, You're welcome, Travis. It's, it's so bad. Uh, so we have Heather, Frank, myself, and Lauren here. Um, Nadia is asking the questions. This is our next question from the AE Plus support group, from our AE Plus support group. Nadia's asking, I just had a therapy session with my son who's 20. The first time after t in the years of trying to help him, and the therapist says, your son will never be able to live independently. God, what do I do now? Get a new therapist. Um, anytime any doctor or therapist says, this will ne your son will never be able to live alone, your son will never be able to do this, screw them. Like, how dare they say that? They don't know what's going on. How dare they say that your son will never be able to live independently? Your son totally can live independently. I've seen it. I've seen it a thousand times. Oh, your child will never be able to live independently, and not only do they live independently, but they are actually more successful than the therapist. That is honestly a sign of a therapist who has their own stuff to do. You get a new therapist, you completely ignore everything that bigoted person had to say, and you move on with your life. You think, I, I like, this is a serious issue to me. How dare any doctor or therapist take somebody's dreams and say, I'm gonna shit on this. You can't do this. Screw I th them. I think you can't. I think can't is, you know, short of laws of physics, can't is a really terrible word to say to anyone, much less a developing person. It's it's really toxic. I, I there, there aren't any details in here about their situation, so we really can't talk specifically about how to work through different situations, but problem solving and root cause analysis are actually fairly easy to learn. And, and this therapist is, is clearly deficient in humanity. <laughs> I, I would just have to make that assessment. I can assess that about that therapist. Yes. I would. I like that. Defi <laughs> you are deficient in humanity. <laughs> that was probably my daily moment of brilliance. I yeah. only get one, but they're <laughs> usually good. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, um, when I say find another therapist, you want to find somebody who gets it, who knows what they're doing. That may take trial and error. You may need to interview a whole bunch of therapists. Um, we, it, you said you had a therapy session with your son who is 20. So it sounds like I'm gonna infer that he agreed to therapy. And hopefully that therapist didn't say this in front of your son. Um, but what you do is, is getting a, more of like a coach mentor guide therapist rather than like a cognitive behavioral therapist because most issues with Asperger's aren't either cognitive nor behavioral anyway. Mm -hmm. um, someone that is like a somatic body-based practice like somatic experiencing or somebody that's more of a mentor role would yes. actually assist you because their job is not to do stuff that this deficient in humanity person is saying. Mm -hmm. It's the exact right. opposite. Let's, let's, let's embrace potential yeah. That's that's really what it's about in, in anybody's life is embracing their potential. Yeah. And there's a solution to every problem. There is. It might be hard. It might be hard. You may have mitigation plans. You, it may be, you know, but nothing is impossible. You just got to think through it. Yeah, especially it says it's your first time. So I'm sure that you're a little nervous and you're really trusting what this therapist says. but Don't. This is a good and opportunity for you to follow up with your son and say, wow, they really did not have our number. We need to try something else. And that's really yeah. okay, too, because yeah. failure is iterative success. And, you know, it, the first time out may not work well. The thing is, is that you'll see where you'll see where the problems are, and then you can sit down and work through a plan to address those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If your son wants to live independently, it absolutely can happen for him. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing I found is that when people are put in a position, you kind of got one or two choices, sink or swim. We kind of have a natural tendency to swim. So, you know, and if they do sink, well, you can be there to, you know, pull them up and... Yeah. 
you know, um, the water out and so, turn a new something weapon. I would do here is I'm just going to no. sort of assume that he's in defense mode, and I'm going to assume that that he's still living at home um, mm-hmm. because he's, your son will never be able to live independently. He says that he's living at home, mm-hmm. um, so. Going through our defense mode materials and understanding what defense mode is and helping him through that, and then also buying our launch course at AspergerExperts.com um, is really going to help guide you through how to co-create a plan for him to become independent. Like that is the let me teach you how to get, help your kid become independent course. And it's co-creation. Yeah, he helps create it. He's going to be have ownership of it. Yeah, he'll buy in. It the things that people are, support what they create. Obviously, the therapist ain't creating shit, so the, they aren't supporting any of it. Right, and so your question: What do I do now? Well, you, as my parents have said, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. You you try again. Yeah. With something else, but you know that this doesn't work. So clearly, that's not where you're going to go next time. And, and something to to help maybe your child start feeling more independent so that they can start getting that feeling is working through this with them. Mm -hmm. Um, Sitting down and saying, huh, what do you think about that session? Okay, let's work together to find somebody new that's really, you know, on the same track we are and let them participate, especially at 20. It'll make, it'll build confidence. It'll help them feel independent and a little bit strong, more strong as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And more empowered, I think. The more that they see that they can do it and that there is a plan and and you i mean basically what i tell parents around this age is be their genie you know what do they want to do help make it happen like they have hopes and dreams help make it happen he wants to become a computer programmer cool help make it happen he wants to go climb mount everest cool help make it happen and sometimes that's just helping them identify the path that they need to take yeah you know what do i do now whatever the next step is you know keep moving forward even mm-hmm. sometimes you shuffle but you just keep moving forward and i think this is the age maybe where you start to transition from coach to cheerleader as well so you help point them in the right direction you help them along the steps and then you back up and you cheer them on and you and you and let them start to establish a feeling of independence mm-hmm. yeah i think i i completely agree let's see what the the crowd says um and you're saying mom guilt is the worst, especially if you have children who need more help. Mom guilt yeah. is terrible. Mom guilt, yeah, it's a thing. Definitely. Um, Anna's saying, I spent four months trying to find a psychologist to work with my son in his sadness. I most prefer to diagnose and work for the schools than work with them. Eh. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really depends on the area. And nowadays, there's if you're not like looking for somebody to like, diagnose meds and stuff, okay. you can even do online. I'm like finding a good therapist online can be something that can help because, you know, Skype works great. You know, Mm -hmm. we can pretty much video chat with people. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, we are going to take another quick break and then we will be back talking about a few more things. We're going to be talking about uh, computer obsessions and when you feel so lonely and need support. So be back in just a sec. I would like to officially invite you to join us in person for a weekend workshop we call Deep Into Defense Mode Live. The next dates are November 12th and 13th, 2016 in San Francisco, California, February 11th and 12th, 2017 in Orlando, Florida, and May 20th and 21st in Los Angeles, California, and that is 2017 as well. You can get more details and register at aspergerexperts.com workshop. We only have 50 spots available for each location. And the reason why I love this is because this is my opportunity to meet you in person, to help you understand what it is to be in defense mode and how to get out. And really, you know, coach some people, help some people, interact with some people, have lunch with some people, dance with some people. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about gaining new experiences and new tools. So if you are wondering what it's like to be a part of the Didim Live seminar, watch this. I'm Ty Miller, and I came out here with my son, Austin, uh, who has Asperger's. 
And what I perceived what was going to happen was it was just going to be instructions directly to my son, Austin, on things he can do or needs to do to improve, to make his life easier, both socially, academically. But what I learned were the tools that, that I need to obviously uh, earn more of his trust, but also but the tools I've learned are going to help him as, as well as myself. But the the most important thing is you know he lives with us he's in and and of course his home our home but i have learned some great tools that help me that will in turn help him and i see exactly how it's going to work and and this 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 was a great seminar i was pleased with everybody and i highly suggest this to to anyone you know obviously with the child with asperger's but really it's just a great course for anybody and uh that's it So as I said in the commercial, I hope that you do join us for Deepened in Defense Mode Live, November 12th and 13th in San Francisco. Um, and as well, I hope you you know you join AE Plus, AspergerExperts.com slash support. And post in the group, say hi to all the wonderful people. I saw this in the group this morning. And I wasn't going to include this in the show, but really thought that it was really, really good because it was just really cool. So I want to read it for you now. It says, I have been a part of this group for a while now, but my life is crazy busy and I've seldom felt able to spend much time reading what everyone shares on here. Recently, our two teenage sons with autism had been very challenging and I felt more lonely, sad, depressed, discouraged, and isolated than ever before. One night, I was sitting in my office crying in front of the computer and looking at Facebook and one of the messages from this group was in my newsfeed, so I started to read it. And then I clicked into the group and started reading other messages. As I read, the tears continued to blur my vision, but they changed from tears of grief to tears of gratitude. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you who takes time to share on here. Your vulnerability in sharing from the heart made me surrounded by others who get it. And I didn't feel like I was on an island anymore. I've continued reading on here and I have been able. And I have to say that I have so much love and respect for everyone on here. You're amazing, beautiful souls who make this world a better place. Thank you for the gift of this group, Danny. Well, first of all, you are very welcome. The group that she is talking about is our AE Plus support group. And you can join and get those similar feelings at AspergerExperts.com slash support. We You're welcome amazing you. amazing people. Yeah, it's inside our AE Plus membership. And you just go into the main yeah. page and you can link into our Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing, amazing to see all these people amazing. support each other. So. We sure hope that you will join us and not feel so alone inside of the AE Plus support group. Heather, um, how did it feel before you sort of found all of this? Oh, uh, we were at a loss. We were at a loss. We really didn't. We, we hadn't yet gotten a diagnosis. There were some other issues that had needed our attention that were a little more urgent. But we were, we were really at a loss because we knew that something was up and that the techniques that we knew weren't working for any of us and and it was a lot of frustration and it was a lot of sadness and it was a lot of big feelings all the way around it was very overwhelming and then we found at my son's teacher recommended asperger experts to us and um i i bought their flagship product and and started employing some of the techniques and my son was so happy that there were other approachable people in this world that were just the sense of identification for him was was huge he, that 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 there was somebody out there he didn't he didn't feel so alone yeah and that is what made me start feeling less alone and uh and once i started feeling less alone and started reaching out it was where they didn't have the the support group back then um this was early 2015 and late 2014 and uh and as i've kind of been really fortunate to be a part of that kind of growth it's it's been even better aiden has been in some videos now yeah. and, and has you know a couple of pictures and stuff that are on the facebook page and he has really found a lot of belonging here and a lot of inspiration it, mm -hmm. yeah the minecraft server as well for you know yeah. he spends a lot of time He's a mod. Yeah, he's a moderator mm -hmm. and uh, spends a lot of time helping people out and building things and just kind of being awesome. He's kind of he's really good at redstone. 
<laughs> really good at redstone. <laughs> so um, we have a Minecraft server for the kids if you want to join AspergerExperts.com. Or for you if you support. are yeah. a grown-up and play because yeah, it's great. Come, hey, yeah, hang on, why not? <laughs> We like it. No, we have, there's a number of uh, adults that uh, play very regularly and, and have created amazing things on the server. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's not just. So, um, our final question comes from Barbara. And Frank, why don't you read this one? I've been reading all of them. Do you want? Do you want to? I take, can read it. You can read it. Heather, can someone, you touch uh, a yeah, bit? here, go. Okay. Barbara says. I am trying very hard to figure this out. My son's only goal right now is to be on his computer. The rules are no computer until after homework and chores are done. The problem is that he is going through his homework and doing the bare minimum just to get to the computer faster. He does not even try to put thought into anything. And when I try to get him to do more, I get him yelling that he can't, doesn't, have to, won't do more. He's 14 and in the 10th grade. His grades are now going to be affecting his future, but he doesn't care. He will be taking the PSATs next week. Excuse me, I'm trying to get him to do a practice exam so he knows what to expect and he flat out refuses. He is becoming lazy and is putting on weight. If I ask him to do something, he screams at me. I try to validate his feelings and he has a safe space, I think, but I don't know how much longer I can do it. My husband yells and takes away the computer and that causes crying and screaming. I have been trying to explain and draw a flow chart of sorts to help him see that if he wants to do what he wants to do when he grows up, he has to get good grades in college, which means he has to get into a good college, which means that he has to get good grades now, which means he has to put his best effort into his schoolwork now. I don't know what to do at this point. I am afraid that once he gets it, it will be too late. That's a common... It's a big, big... That's a big concern. That's a big concern, and it's very, very common Mm -hmm. to have an issue like that Mm -hmm. it sounds like to me that the issue is not necessarily that he's in defense mode once i mean it's shocking right Uh, but that barbara you're you're just lacking some basic influence and parenting skills here you say that he said he doesn't want to yeah no judgment there's literally just a lack of skill they don't come with instruction manuals yeah they don't it's it's okay to not have a skill we can learn skills yeah that's that's, that's what we do here is we teach skills that's right so that's literally just like, oh, well, that's easy. You just need to learn the skill. And the skill is learning how to influence. We're releasing our influence circles course tomorrow. So that's really going to help. Um, if you aren't on our email list, join our email list and check out our Facebook page tomorrow as well. But in addition, it I mean, it sounds like there's just sort of this like, for me, the, the big thing that I take away from this is that She's sort of learned the defense mode stuff. He has a safe place and all that stuff. But she's just been backing off and doesn't know actually when to exert and and say, no, this is the way we're doing things. Well, the thing that I see in here first is that, first off, she says, I try to validate his feelings. And he has a safe space, I think, which is the first thing to get my attention. Have you asked him if he has a safe space outside of the computer? And the second thing is that then you go on to say, but I don't know how much longer I can do it, which means you don't have a safe space. And if you don't take care of yourself and give yourself that downtime, you're not going to be able to approach this with an effective strategy. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, She has more to say, actually. She even wrote a comment mm-hmm. underneath. So Barbara then goes on to say, the goal of being a video game designer is not what my vision would be for him. I see strengths in other areas. It is what his goal is. He knows what education path he needs to take to get there. He doesn't seem to be able to understand that choices he makes now affects things in the future. I am not only talking about years from now. I mean, even things like if you don't understand the books that book that is assigned to you in English class, you're going to fail the test on said book next week. He skims the book enough to say he turned all the pages so he can get to the computer faster. Last month, I asked him to pause playing the computer for long enough to help me by starting a load of long and he did it but had such an attitude that he slammed the washer door so hard that he broke it Uh, this is complicated yeah the thing that stands out to me here is that he's rushing to do his homework and and then so he can go play video games that's like the perfect recipe for a responsibility agreement because the issue is he the agreement is once you do your homework you can play video games the agreement should be once you do your homework correctly the first time without arguing, you can go and play video games. And in the way we schedule it, there's generally a structured time for homework. It's it's it can be once you're done with your homework, you can play video games, but but really there isn't a lot of time. So that if you rush through it, you're still going to be sitting there. So you might as well take your time with your homework. Yeah, I mean we do is uh, 
kids do homework first and then they need to read for at least 30 minutes because reading is part of homework at mm -hmm. least in, in at our school and so then you know after that point is when they can do it which is usually around 4 30 so we just say after here's your time get mm -hmm. snack you get yourself situated get your homework done get your reading done take the dog for a walk and then Mm -hmm. then, then then you have a certain amount of time that's your time before we need to get ready for dinner and you need to participate in our in, in, in our celebration of food and then you know get ready for bed and then and do that so um, and we try to be flexible and, and do that but we also set the guidelines that you know they're not on the computer you know it's like I totally respect computer time and, and that my kids yeah. want mm -hmm. that and deserve that and we, ha we I get on there and have fun with them but we try to put a little bit more structure in place so that it, it, there's clear expectations. It's like, yeah. I can just walk in and, uh, like I was home yesterday and picked him up from school and, um, you know, I came in and I'm like, okay, what do you guys got to do? Okay, you know your routine. I don't need to tell you the routine. You already know it. So mm -hmm. go forth and do. <laughs> now, one of the big things is that when he broke the washer door, that is not only a repair cost, but it's also an opportunity cost of clean clothes for the whole family. He has then had his anger and, and lack of, of self-control, really, is, is becoming a problem for the other areas of the household. And that has other consequences to it that are natural and also discouraging. Like, if I have to go to the laundromat while we're waiting for the washer to get fixed, you may not play on your computer while I'm gone. I don't, that's kind of arbitrary, but I could see how it could make sense. Or, or you, you have to pay yeah. to have the washer fixed, exactly. depending on how old and if they have income. There are certain natural consequences that could go along with that. You know, because that has a larger impact on household productivity. That is not just, I won't take the garbage out. That's now a major household appliance is broken. And there have to be consequences to these sorts of things. And the natural consequences are enough. You don't have to trump up, you know, make up big, grandiose, unrelated consequences. Yeah. No dessert for a week. What? Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with clean clothes. But if people have to wash clothes by hand or if somebody can't be on the computer while mom has to yeah. go to the laundromat and that money is not able to purchase other games or yeah. things on the computer because that's money that now has to go towards fixing the washer and making sure that the laundromat's paid for, then, you know, opportunity costs are also real consequences. Yeah. Lauren, what do you see with this? Um, well, the first thing that stuck out was that he's 14. Yeah. So we've got we've got puberty and hormones playing into this as well but well, I also, enough. <laughs> I, know. Um, I think he's drawn to the computer I would assume based on the stuff that I've had many conversations with other parents on is he finds comfort there he finds safety there he finds control in the video games and that tells me he's not feeling any of that in his exterior life so he it's so it's self-soothing for him so he he's not finding that anywhere in his exterior life so i'd say he still is in defense mode he is not finding that soothing and that comfort anywhere else and that to me if i were coaching that's where i'd start is and working when in somebody that can angle. come in and take away your safe space you know like i'm sure that when when his computer gets taken away, he's had probably half an hour of warnings, and there's been discussion about it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's heels digging in. But but when you walk in, when somebody's upset, and you take away the very thing that's helping them chill, it's it's a tougher situation. You're in a very difficult situation. I can't deny it, and and it's real. And we have this same conversation in my household, you know, fairly regularly. But natural consequences can often you know if you're shielding your kid from the consequences and trying to incur when you do flow charts and things this child does not have the part of their brain you're right he doesn't understand that his actions have later consequences he doesn't because he's that. 14 that 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 part of their brain comes when they're 23 to 25 you got another right. decade to go Right. And so and so you're right. You're absolutely right. He doesn't get it. And so the focus has to be on the details. You know, and and so and that's I and I see something really encouraging here. Your son at 14 has a passion that he mm -hmm. wants to go and explore. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Like that's awesome. He has focus. He has drive. This is what he wants to do. You can wrap that all around, you know, providing the things that he does need and he's going to need later on mm -hmm. around this topic and around this area. This actually makes some things easier for you. You're not going to have to fight him as long as you can show it how he relates 
to him getting to becoming a video game designer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's and, and and there's lots of programs, there's lots of different things, but uh, you know, support him in this. This is his passion. Us as human beings, like, let's go out 10 years from now, right? He's 24. He's maybe graduated from college. He's going to go off into the real world. Do you want him going off every day into the real world, going to a job because it's a job? Or do you want him going out every day into the world to go do his passion? Mm-hmm. I can tell you which one he's going to be happy at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, get, you know, set him up to be, you know, to, to enjoy his journey and to live it fully. I also want to point out the section of my husband yells and takes away the computer and that causes crying and screaming. And that's a major part of the issue right there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, m- my advice would be to the husband, don't yell and take away the computer. I know it's not that easy, but like that, but that's a large part of it. Now, and, one of the things that I also see is kids who rush through their homework like that, it's oftentimes not just that they want to get to the computer, but there may be other re- problems that your child is not even aware of. One of the common um, comorbidity is such an ugly word, but it means things that happen along with. So uh, one of the common comorbidities of Asperger's is actually something called dysgraphia, I think, which is pain when you're writing. Your hands actually hurt. That leads to handwriting problems. It leads to noncompliance with homework. It leads to a lot of things. If your child can get a more comfortable writing implement or to be able to keyboard their homework, oftentimes that makes the road easier. So if you find that there is something in the environment or in the actual task that is physically uncomfortable for your child, address that and you may find the path gets easier. Yeah. And you know the uh, you know looking at some self care for yourself and for your husband. Yeah. You know it sounds like you guys have been on a difficult journey. Um, you know if we can't take care of ourselves and we don't have the, our own resiliency about when things go wrong around us and we get frustrated and then we not intentionally but you know our natural thing is you know oh this things this is the thing I got to fix it and I can't fix this and it's really frustrating. What you know take a step back take a deep breath. Go for a walk. Um, you know, spend some time for yourself. Do a massage. Go yeah. floating. Uh, do somatic massage. Uh, treat yourself well. Eat. Have a cup so, of tea. Have yeah. a cup of tea. Sit down. You know, close off the door. Go, to go take a nice hot bath. Like, take some time for yourself and take care of yourself. Because the more you can do that, the more you're going to be able to be there for when he can't be there for himself. Right, because the alternative is I can't take care of myself. I have to go yell at my kid. And that, you know, that, that, okay, can you take a break from yelling at your kid just for 15 minutes to go do something nice for yourself? Because, because the alternative is just proceeding on to yell at your kid. I know that I finally had to interrupt that pattern and, and just disengage for a few minutes. And and that pattern for me was really self defeating because, you know, I would yell at my kid and then I'd like feel bad about it and then you know guilt should shame you yeah and then you know and and that's not productive for anyone and it just kind of and then you get stuck there and you kind of get stuck there so maybe trying to you know change your reaction Mm -hmm. first yeah and look at you know and 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 you know being older you can start to analyze that and look at that and and maybe do some work on yourself around that so that you can you know look at what your impulse your inputs are that you know go allow you to go into defense mode because a lot of this is us going into defense mode ourselves Mm -hmm. and we do that everyone does that naturally when we don't have our basic needs taken care of and you know that's hunger you know thirst food etc uh sleep uh frustration um so one of the things i would do is take a look at yourself and see how you can make some little changes so that you can be there more for yourself would be my suggestion i agree I agree. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so we're going to take one more quick break, and then we will be right back talk some more. See you in a sec. Thanks. I remember growing up and not really having many friends, wanting friends, but not having many friends simply because I didn't know how to be social with people. My name is Heather. I'm the COO here at Asperger Experts, and I'm a mom. My son was diagnosed with Asperger's a little more than a year ago, and he's amazing. I'm trying to raise a productive, independent, self-supporting person. 
I need support to do that. I can't do it by myself. And we're back. So um, we have a few questions from the comment section about, hey, are we even looking at the comments? Yeah, we're looking at the comments. Um, we are really the, live. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is in fact October 20th, um, 2016. All day. Uh, yeah, 1.44 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and uh, this show is, is taking questions from the AE Plus support group. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we take a lot more questions from the comments and, and talk about specific things. Generally, on Tuesdays, we talk about issues related to the Asperger's family. And then on Wednesdays, we talk about issues related to thriving with Asperger's. Um, so, yeah. Um, but we have a few time for a, a few questions here. So, uh, Dan Danielle is asking, my son might be in defense mode, how do I know? Danielle, if you go through our um, defense mode class, up above there's a link that says learn more about defense mode, defense aspergerexperts.com slash free class. If you go through that, it'll talk to you and, and teach you, it's, it's free class. It'll teach you, here's what you know when you're in defense mode and how to get your son out of defense mode. Um, let's see. Um, it takes my son a while to fall asleep, and he wakes up sometimes in the middle of the night. Somebody was suggesting a sleep study for that. I um, in in sleep apnea is in my family, and one of the things that you find with sleep apnea is that people will try to stay up really late so that they get really tired, and that way they feel like they get better sleep, and then they have a hard time waking up, and it tends to be a really difficult pattern. It's also sometimes accompanied by nightmares or night terrors because your body knows that you're not breathing even if you're not awake. Um, it's difficult and it can affect your ability to cope during the day. It can affect how you measure time. It can affect cognition, a whole lot of things. Oftentimes now when people are saying the kids have ADD or ADHD, a sleep study is recommended because sleep deprivation can cause these exact same symptoms. Um, so a sleep study is, is often warranted. Now, if somebody's having night terrors, night terrors can be caused by a lot of things, including hormones and experiences and trauma and and sometimes they just happen um, and they're pretty awful I've had them before and I don't care to repeat them but uh, but I would say that for night terrors you know really in just about everything we do we talk about emotional safety uh, because when your limbic system perceives that you're in danger your whole body acts like it's in danger whether you actually are or not it's not something you can consciously control night terrors are definitely a state of that waking up out of sleep feeling like you're in danger is a terrible terrible feeling so anything you can do to help your child feel safe whether it's a nightlight or a stuffy or a spray can with a label about monster repellent whatever you need to do mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of ideas about helping children feel safe and a lot of people are very weirded out by the idea of having a child sleep in your room with you it depends on your own personal boundaries really some people just need nobody you know in their room but some people say okay I can put a cot at the foot of my bed and my kid can sleep there when they have a night terror really it depends on the family and and what your values are and where you need to be but every family that that has come to us has had a value of caring about the emotional safety of the family members and i think that's a great place to start yeah uh vicky's asking can i access the material from the uk yeah you can access any of our course material from anywhere in the world mm -hmm. um or if they have wi-fi on the moon i guess you can do it th too there but i'd like thinking. to know who provides that signal right <laughs> i mean there are satellites so in theory you just sort sure. of turn them slightly and then like the, stop pointing them at Earth and just sort of point them at the moon and beam the Wi-Fi down from there. And All for me, right? It, it could work. Um, <laughs> hi, Dana. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's a conversation, a sort of parallel conversation going on about emotional safety. Okay. And that is the thing. It's, it's if you are in defense mode or your child's in defense mode, they do not feel safe. Nothing else will happen until they feel safe and it's not cognitive so you can't say why don't you feel safe the fact is that you don't and you have to troubleshoot instead of troubleshooting root cause of not feeling safe in the moment you have to troubleshoot how can we get you to feel safe 
And that is, you know, what can we do to soothe the immediate anxiety? Mm -hmm. Anxiety can't be controlled. It can only be managed. So how do you manage the anxiety in the moment? Right. Well, nothing can really be controlled. But right. It's a so, you know, it's, it's like water, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, how can, what can we, soothers really are very important. Make actual physical lists of things that soothe you. Try them. See if they work. And then when you get anxious, just work your list. Two lists of ten. It's very helpful. Um, and and so, you know, de, de, what Decreasing, yes, decreasing the level of sensory stimulus for, for kids with Asperger's is also very important because something might be visually auditory or, or olfactory, Somebody, something might be very overwhelming. Emotions can also create a state of overwhelm and, and those kinds of things can just shut a person down and they don't even really know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Do you want to talk about defense mode a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Heather did a great job. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I asked this because she, she's recently ex gone, oh, that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I currently am in defense mode, actually, if we're going to be honest. You're processing um, it. I have been in it before. I have coached it many, many times, but I... I'm in it right now, so I can actually understand. Um, basically, what defense mode feels like to me and to a lot of the clients that I work with is complete and extreme overload to the point where you can't. You just can't. You just can't. You just can't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I seem to get out of it when I'm coaching, which seems to be my safe zone for some reason, mm -hmm. um, and connecting with people. But when I'm on my own, I tend to be. Um, I literally have to walk myself through steps of, okay, brush your teeth, eat. We well, you have to feel it then. And, oh yeah, there's that word. Um, I forget words. Um, my, everything stops working. And mm -hmm. it is literally such an, and you don't, it doesn't feel like anxiety. It just feels like everything's just stopped. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to these guys this week and I, and I know what's going on and I have the words to articulate. Um, the fact that I can't articulate or uh, that I, I'm exhausted and I don't... Food. This is an interesting mm -hmm. one. Um, I'm usually very experimental on food and I'm finding when I'm at this level, I don't... I was telling Danny, I don't want anything but, the, but like predictable foods. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting and I think that's what happens when we're in defense mode. These so, kids, you know, teaching social skills when you're in defense mode totally works. Yeah, it totally works because they're really going to understand what you're talking yeah, about. No. If your goal is to completely frustrate everybody, then yes, you're working. Yeah, yeah. It's, working. so trying to find, so they're going to go toward their comfort foods of, of whatever the four things is that they eat. And I'm doing, I'm finding myself doing the same thing. I'm like, I don't want that exploratory, you know, or experimental Mexican dish. I want fajitas because mm -hmm. I know what they taste like. So it's really, you can see these patterns. So it's immense stress lacking verbiage, um, going toward things that are comfortable and safe, uh, whether it be location or people or food, um, high amounts of overload in any type of stimulus situation, going to the grocery store, anything just shuts you down a little bit. So the best, I'm using every technique I teach all of Transitions you. Transitions are hard too. It's, it's a, yeah, because you might get your grounding for five minutes and then something happens or mm -hmm. somebody says something or there's too bright a light or a weird smell and all of a sudden you're back in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these kids don't have the the ability to articulate what they're going through. They don't even understand what it is they're going through. So yep. parents, those are the things to look for. And our you know, deep in defense mode course is, is amazing. Um, I, I've learned all about it myself working with Danny and these guys. And, and if you really want to come, I seriously come hang out with us for a weekend at deep in defense mode live. Mm -hmm. um, AspergerExperts.com slash workshop will be in, in, in San Francisco in November 12th and 13th. So come say hi. Um, so next week we will be back on Tuesday at 11 a.m. talking about the Asperger's family. Wednesday at 3 p.m. This is all Pacific time, by the way. Wednesday at 3 p.m., Thriving with Asperger's. And then one week from today, same time, that is 1 p.m. Pacific time. We will be right back here talking about uh, well, more questions from the AE Plus support group. So uh, say hi in the AE Plus support group. We'll be here for you and see you all next week. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Y'all are awesome. Bye. Bye.